his speech, the title for his speech is Incentives. Incentives, welcome and welcome. Last week, my mom made a remark to me. She said, it's, it's ironic that you and your brother are such good cooks when I'm a terrible cook. See, the truth is, my mom might not be the world's greatest cook, but she's actually the one who's responsible for my brother and I being good cooks. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. If you want to create lasting change in someone's behavior, you have to understand what motivates them you have to understand the incentives that they're working on. For example, I was eight years old. My mom was cooking breakfast for us. <clears throat> and I said, Mom, when you make my eggs, can you leave it a little runny so I can dip my toast in it? She said, Ron, if you don't like the way I cook your eggs, you can cook them yourself. Now, I was eight years old. I didn't understand sarcasm. So I thought, I don't like the way you cook my eggs. So I got up and I cooked them myself. And rather than being offended and thinking, oh, you don't like my cooking, well, my mom recognized the opportunity. She has an opportunity to make a lasting change in my life by incentivizing independence. She's incentivizing a behavior she wants. So rather than being upset, she lets me do it and praises me for doing it. Her friends come over next week, she's bragging about what a great job her son did. That praise was enough incentive to spur me forward to want to cook. We all understand the basics of motivation. We understand if you reward something, you'll get more of that behavior. If you punish a behavior, you'll get less of it. The problem is it's not always that simple. You don't always have a clear understanding of the motivation. For example, there's an idea called a perverse incentive. It's when you provide an incentive and you get the exact opposite behavior that you wanted. Many years ago in India, they had a problem with too many snakes. So the government said, this is easy to get rid of. All we'll do is we'll provide people money when they bring in a dead snake. Great idea. They had loads of snakes coming in. And then after a while, the government realized there are farmers raising snakes. And so, of course, they realized we're wasting our money. And so they stopped the incentive program and the farmers let all the snakes go. A perverse incentive is when you get the exact opposite of what you want. To make it more complicated, not everyone is incentivized by the same things. For example, you have situations in grade school where you'll get a child who acts up. The teacher says, you keep doing that, you're coming for a detention. And they give the child a detention in the next day, in the next week, the child is just as crazy, acts up just as much, if not more. For some children, they crave attention. And so that one-on-one -on -one attention that they're not getting at home, they're getting from the teacher after school. That detention is actually an incentive for them. Now I'm a teacher, as many of you know, my challenge for incentives is recognizing that anything I say or do will motivate some and demotivate others. I had a club uh, called Code Reach. Now this was for grade seven and eight students. The idea was we want to incentivize you to examine, pursue computer science. And so we brought in about 70, 80 students from grade schools. I had a number of students helping out teaching these students computer science. And the idea was you could see an actual high school student doing this. It was, it was a fun social environment. But the key to any motivation is you have to examine the results. The truth was, a few years later when I'm looking at the students who went to the program, I wasn't getting the results I wanted. I wanted them to be motivated. I wanted them to be interested. Instead, I had some students who were motivated, they were more interested. But some students would do less work because they thought they already knew it. And worse, there are some students who came in grade seven 
and they found the material too difficult. And so even though their brain has developed by the time they're in grade 10, they decide, that's not for me. They don't have the ability to say, ah, grade 7 me wasn't clever enough for this, but grade 10 me is. They don't have that ability. Instead, they say, I've already decided this. It's not for me. It's like if you decide you don't like anchovies. You don't like anchovies. And so by examining the results, I realized this is not for me. So if you have children and you have done something successfully with one of them and it doesn't work for the next one, odds are the incentive structure isn't working for them. It's how they perceive the issue. As a child, praise was a big thing for me. If, if, you, if you praise something, because that motivated me. I, I wanted to be seen as the good child, the good student. Praise was big for me. That's not for everyone, though. That's not everyone's motivation factor. The key to understanding incentives is looking at the results. The, the results speak truth. If you're not getting the results you want, change what you're doing. This is not a new concept, obviously. And I think Antoine de Saint Uxbury expressed the idea best. He said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up men to collect wood, divide the labor, give orders. Instead, teach the men to yearn for the. <laughs> I can't do fun. Teach the men to yearn for the vast and boundless seas. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Ron, for sharing your mod 